Several years ago, I officiated at a funeral service of a woman outside of our community down in Southern California. Maggie was only 50 years old when she died of cancer. But in those uh, 50 years, she had lived what you might call a very colorful life. In fact, Maggie was what someone called a biker mama. <laughs> Evidently, at one time she could uh, out-drink, out-spit, out-fight, and out-cuss just about everybody else in the biker gang. Uh, all of her life, she worked hard, she played hard, and she lived hard. Well, before the service started that day, I noticed a lot of rough-looking characters coming into the chapel, family and fam uh, friends that wanted to come and pay their final respects to Maggie. In fact, with all the black leather jackets and biker boots and Harleys or hogs parked out there in the parking lot, I knew this was going to be a rather different memorial service. I began the service with prayer. I read a couple of scripture passages, and then I, I shared a bio on the life of Maggie. I then opened it up for a sharing of memories. I invited anybody there that wanted to come up to the podium and say a few words about what Maggie had meant to them. And dozens came up and shared story after colorful story of Maggie. Mostly accounts of how maybe crazy, coarse, and crude she really was. But they also shared how she was such a loyal friend. It was obvious that all of her family and friends there in that chapel loved Maggie. What most of them didn't realize was that just a few days before she died, Maggie had trusted Christ as her Lord and Savior. And so I, was, I told how Maggie had shared with her best friend that while she was lying there in that hospital week, just the week before, or hospital room, just the week before, she had overheard a pastor praying out loud for someone else on the other side of the curtain in that same room. And Maggie lay there and she just quietly listened and she simply made the prayer that she heard her own prayer as she trusted Christ as her Lord and Savior right then and there. Unknown, that unknown pastor in the room that day never knew the impact he was making on another person on the other side of that curtain. Well, the next day, Maggie told her best friend that she was flooded with an overwhelming sense of joy and peace. Maggie's heart had been touched. She had been transformed in a powerful way. She knew Christ was real. She knew uh, Christ had forgiven her and that she was confident now that she was one of God's children. And in the next few days, she asked God for his uh, peace and his comfort and strength as she faced the fears of certain death. And the Lord met her right where she was. And she joyfully and confidently went home to be with her newfound Savior and Lord. Well, I shared that at the service, and I pointed out that God had forgiven Maggie of all of her sins because of what Christ did in dying on the cross, and that he paid for all of her sins, past, present, and future, and that it was something that she couldn't earn, and it was something that she couldn't deserve any more than any of us. And that the Lord had given Maggie his presence, his peace, and his hope as she faced her time of greatest need. Furthermore, I explained how she was now in heaven at that very moment, safe and secure in the loving arms of her Savior. Well, looking around the chapel that day, I've got to be honest, I saw a lot of cynical looks as I was sharing that story. So many disbelieving faces of skepticism and doubt. In fact, while I was sharing the story, I noticed more than a few people rolling their eyes, looking at one another, shaking their head, and scowling at me. They were totally convinced I was making the whole thing up. They all knew Maggie, and they, they knew that she was anything but religious. But I went on to share that any po if any positive outcome uh, could result from Maggie's death, maybe it would be that each of them would reevaluate their own lives in relationship to the Lord, and maybe they would come to grips where, they're, uh, where they themselves are at and come to know the Savior that Maggie had come to know. I quoted 2 Corinthians 6, 2, which I always quote. Now is the time of, the, of, of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Why? Because we don't have tomorrow. Well, then I added something that I think really shook everybody up. I stated that if Maggie were right here, right now, standing here at this very moment in front of you all, that would be her primary concern for every one of you. Do you know the Savior? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And suddenly someone sitting in the back of the chapel yelled out, Bull! 
Or at least that's half of what he said. And many in the room nodded in agreement. They looked at each other and nobody in the room who knew her was convinced or could really believe that Maggie could become a Christian. In fact, all the cold looks and the scowled faces <laughs> kind of gave me a thought that maybe after the service I would be confronted by some very angry bikers. Somewhat frustrated, I went ahead and I closed in prayer and I turned to sit down. It was right then that a big burly guy with black, slick black, back hair uh, bolted out of the front row. And uh, to be honest, uh, he looked like a hitman named Tony from The Sopranos. <laughs> and Tony stepped up to the pulpit and he announced that before anybody leaves the chapel, he had a few words to say. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. He introduced himself as Maggie's big brother. From Chicago, of course. He had to be from Chicago. And he basically said this. He said, I just want to say that what the preacher said was absolutely true. He said, my sister called me on the phone the day before she died, and she told me that she had a peace and joy that she had never known before. She told me that she had prayed to receive Jesus into her heart and that she knew that she was a child of God and that she was going to be in heaven. And I know it's true, he told everybody, because I did the same thing. And if you want to know what real living is all about, you need to trust Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then he sat down, and the room was dead quiet. I remember sitting there breathing both a huge sigh of relief and joy. The grace, the love, the mercy of Jesus had been powerfully demonstrated again on that day. You know, God is in the transformation, uh, transformation business, and we're reminded again that it's never, ever too late. No matter what you've done, no matter how much time has passed, we pointed this out last week, no matter where you are in life, no matter what you've been through, it's never, ever too late to come to the Savior. And we see that power for you illustrated here in the example of Peter, here in our passage this morning. And the scene that we see unfold here in chapter 26 is also a hostile room of scoffers and angry accusers. Beginning here in verse 57, we come to the very beginning of a very intense trial, the trial of Jesus. Follow with me, if you would, verse 57. And those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter also was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priest and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order that they might put him to death. And they did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and, and said to him, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robe, saying, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists. And others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Let me stop there. It's important to realize here that this entire trial proceeding is basically a farce. It's a, it's a fraud. What they're doing here is entirely illegal, both by Roman law and Jewish law. It was against the law for the Jewish council, that is, the Sanhedrin, to pass any sentence at night. Secondly, it was against the law for the Jewish council to even meet together at night. And so they all have to meet again the next morning in order to make this whole thing legal. In fact, by the time Jesus goes to the cross, he will have endured six, six trials, three religious and three civil. His three religious trials will include having to go before Annas, Caiaphas, and also the Sanhedrin. His three civil trials include having to go before Pilate and Herod, and then back again before Pilate again. So why so many trials? 
Because the whole purpose of all these trials was to try and find some legal basis in which, uh, for which to condemn Jesus to death. They were, they were willing to do anything and everything in which to find evidence to hang him. Now the testimony of Judas would have been critical at this point, but he was nowhere to be found. And so in utter desperation, the Sanhedrin resorts to false witnesses here who are brought in to testify against Jesus. The big problem was all these witnesses contradicted one another. You see, the Old Testament required that there had to be at least two witnesses in any trial who must both agree in their testimony. Deuteronomy 19.15 spelled it out. A single witness, a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. You had to have two or three. And they had to agree. And so the religious leaders here could not get a legal rap sheet on Jesus. In fact, the only flimsy evidence they could come up with, verse 60 tells us, that finally two did come forward and said, this man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Now that smacks of insurrection, they must have thought. And so maybe we can get him on threatening to destroy uh, religious or public property. I mean, that would put him away. But the testimony here in verse 61 is really a perversion of what Jesus had said. Je First of all, Jesus had never said that he would destroy the temple. He said others would. And secondly, Jesus was not talking about the temple, the physical temple there in Jerusalem. He was talking about his own body. In fact, it was something Jesus had said very early on in, at the beginning of his ministry, three years earlier, predicting his crucifixion and resurrection. But it's interesting, they now recall it at this point, just before the cross. But the Sanhedrin court accepts this lame testimony, and when the high priest stood up, he said, Do you make no answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. He didn't say anything. Now, why doesn't he defend himself? Why, why doesn't Jesus answer the charges here against him? Because he had never been officially charged with any crime. And so Jesus remained silent until until the high priest placed him under sacred oath. In verse 63, he said, I assure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. You see, once the high priest charged Jesus under an oath by the living God, well, Jesus had to answer, and he does. In verse 64, Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. I mean, Jesus here not only admits that he's the Messiah, the chosen one, promised in the Old Testament, he gives even more information than they asked for. He adds here in the, that in the future, he's going to sit at the right hand of God the Father and will someday return on clouds of heaven. Now, that's a crystal clear statement of his deity. In other words, he is definitely claiming to be God. There's no more need for witnesses. Said, basically, Jesus said it himself. And the religious leaders here clearly got the message, loud and clear. Verse 65, And the high priest tore his robe, saying, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, He is deserving of death. You know, the people here had two choices when they confronted this issue. One was to acknowledge that what Jesus said was true, and they fall, fall down and, and worship him. That was one option. The other option was to reject him as a blasphemer and put him to death. And they obviously chose the latter. There's no more evidence presented after this point. You know, it's incredible. <laughs> I mean, no one defended Jesus or pointed to all the good things he had done for the past three, three and a half years of ministry. No one pointed that out. No one stood up in the courtroom there and presented the evidence for the miracles that he did. Hundreds of them all proving that Jesus is who he claimed to be. No one pointed to the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah that were fulfilled in Jesus. That's amazing to me. Jesus the Messiah, think about this, the very Son of God had been right there in and among them for over three years. But their attitude was basically, hey, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind's made up. I don't want to hear it. My mind is made up. You know, I think that's exactly the same with many people today, isn't it? You know, they can have all the evidence, all the testimony for the existence of God and the reality of who Jesus Christ really is, but they shrug it off. Hey, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind's made up. 
Jesus described the problem with the Jews here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 14 like this. He said, you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. And you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. And their ears, with their ears, they scarcely can hear. And they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return. And I should heal them. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, But a natural man, that is a fleshly man, a, a, non, a non-spiritual person, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. You know, why is it so frustrating sometimes to talk to some people about spiritual things? It's like banging your head against a wall. They're not listening. They just don't seem to get it. And Paul states here, they are, it's, it's all foolishness to him. They cannot understand it. Why? Because they are spiritually appraised or discerned. In other words, it takes a spiritual person to understand spiritual things. And so when you and I pray for the salvation of that friend or that loved one, remember that it's only the work of the Holy Spirit of God who can open up their spiritual eyes and bring them to a point of salvation. It, they're, dark, they're darkened in their understanding, and, and it's, it's the Holy Spirit of God who has to flip on the light switch. In other words, you can explain the gospel powerfully. You can, you can make the arguments persuasively. You can even model the Christian life perfectly. But only the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, can ultimately change that person's unregenerate heart. Otherwise, it's like trying to describe a rainbow to a blind man. Can't do it. The Apostle Paul describes our problem like this. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even, of, even as the rest. But God, I love that part, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And Jesus tells his disciples but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Now, that Sanhedrin here had Jesus right where they wanted him. And they heard all they wanted to hear, his spoken words of blasphemy. And contrary to all Jewish and Roman law, they took it upon themselves to begin to punish the accused. Look at verse 67. And they spat in his face, beat him with their fists, Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? But the Lord remained silent through it all. You know, it's interesting. Seven centuries earlier, 750 years earlier, a prophet by the name of Isaiah predicted how the Messiah would someday respond. Seven centuries before, in Isaiah 53, 7, the prophet said he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. 1 Peter 2.23 adds, And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. But he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Now while Jesus is going through this trial before the Sanhedrin, Peter is also undergoing a major test. He had followed the Lord... And it somehow gained entrance into the courtyard or the house there of the high priest. That is Caiaphas. Look at verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. And a certain servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. And when he had gone out of the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear. I do not know the man. And immediately a cock crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said. Before a cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. 
What happened? We see Peter here descending basically three steps into denial. Three steps down into the pit of denial. Why? How could that happen? Well, I'm going to suggest, first of all, that uh, he's in the wrong place. I mean, what's he doing in the courtyard to begin with? We don't know. But it's bitterly cold that night, and Peter's heart is cold. His heart isn't right, and he's in the wrong place. That's the first step. Secondly, he's with the wrong crowd. Over in John 18, 18, it describes the scene. Now the servants of the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold, and they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. So here he is, Peter, standing there warming his hand at the same fire that was warming the Savior's captors, the Savior's enemies. I mean, this is hardly a place for a disciple to be. So he's in the wrong crowd. He's in the wrong place. In fact, the Bible gives us a, a warning to steer clear of relationships that might cause you to compromise your convictions. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And so he's in the wrong place. He's with the wrong crowd. And thirdly, he is absolutely confused or, or consumed with fear. How do we know that? Because as he stood there in the courtyard waiting for the outcome of the trial, Peter had three opportunities to speak up for the Lord, and yet he blew it every time. Three times, not once, not twice, three times he denied that he ever knew or had any, in any way, any kind of connection with Jesus at all. And I want you to notice that each of the three confrontations here gets a little more intense. The first denial occurs when a little servant girl said in front of all the others there that Peter was one who had been with Jesus. And, P and Peter replies, I don't know what you're talking about. Intimidated by a little servant girl, Peter denies Christ. You know, it's amazing what undoes us when we are outside the will of God. Even the smallest thing can trip us up. And then it tells us another servant girl even more directly points Peter out at, to the whole group there in the courtyard as someone who had indeed been with Jesus. In verse 72, Peter's response is even more emphatic. I don't even know the man. You know, when you run with the wrong crowd, it's only going to be a matter of time before you have to declare your allegiance. And the pressure here on Peter at this weak point really exposes, really widens the crack of his character. Finally, the whole group of those present accused Peter of being one of those who had been with Jesus. Look at 70, uh, verse 73. And a little later, the bystanders came up and said, Peter, surely you too are one of them, for the way you talk gives you away. Peter had a Galilean accent, uh, a dialect that was a little bit different, and it stood out to these Romans. Uh, someone said it's like an Alabama accent in New York City. I mean, it stood out. They could tell. He wasn't from that area. In other words, he talked what, how he talked basically proved where he was from and who he really was. And in a spiritual sense, I think that's true of all of us. It's our words and actions that really prove to everyone around us what we're really like. In fact, in verse 74, Peter even cuts loose a string of expletive deletives. Then he began to curse and swear. I don't know the man, blank, 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 blank. Huh. Just to emphasize it. And immediately it says, the cock crows. You know, I think that was enough proof right there for the skeptics there in the courtyard. They're looking at him thinking, you know, they know the truth that the mouth speaks out from that which fills the heart. If you want to know what a person's like, listen to their words. It reflects their heart. And this man's heart was not filled with Jesus. And when the cock crowed, it says that Peter suddenly, like a freight train, it hit him. He remembered the word. Peter remembered the word. You see, forgetting the word was what got him in trouble in the first place. Jesus had severely warned Peter that he would deny Christ three times. And so knowing that, what should Peter have been doing? I mean, if he really believed that what Jesus told him would happen, what should Peter have done? What would you do if you knew you were going to blow it big time? What would you do? When you and I are vulnerable to failure, when we are susceptible to sin, what do we do? Knowing that uh, he was weak and vulnerable to failure and susceptible to sin, Peter should have been praying all night. Lord, protect me. Help me not to do that. 
Or at the very least, gotten together with the other disciples for the support and encouragement that he would desperately need to keep that heart warm. Instead, Peter joined Christ's enemies there and he warms himself around their fire. <laughs> but now, by suddenly remembering the word, his heart, his cold heart was warmed again and he wept in repentance. Peter realized right away that he had blown it, that he had failed the Lord. And though he had promised that he would never forsake the Lord, he had publicly denied the one he loved three times. Filled with remorse, it tells us that as soon as he heard the cock crow, he left the courtyard and all night long he wept bitterly. Here's the point. When we fall into temptation, there's no avoiding the bitter aftertaste. Have you ever been there? Um, sure you have. We all have. I've been there. But here's the good news, and I pointed this out before. Jesus will not give up on his disciples who fail him, ever. In fact, after he faced his failure and repented, Peter was forgiven, he was restored, and he became useful again in the Lord's service. I love that uh, I quoted before of Corey Ten Boom. No pit is so deep where his grace and forgiveness is not deeper still. In other words, there is no failure so great that a Christian cannot rise from it. What a huge contrast to Judas. The results with him were, were far different. I mean, unbelievable. Verse 1 of chapter 27. And when morning had come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the sanctuary and departed, and he went away and hanged himself. Wow. And the chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, It is not lawful to put them into the temple treasury, since it is the price of blood. And they counseled together, with the, and, and with the money, bought the potter's field as a, as a burial place for strangers. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. And then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Oh, real quickly, by way of application this morning, uh, what was the basic difference between Judas and Peter? I mean, when you look at these two men, they had a lot in common. I mean, they both followed the Lord for three, three and a half years as his disciples. Both of them. They, they both uh, boasted of their love and devotion to the Lord. They had witnessed firsthand his powerful teachings. They witnessed together all the miracles that Jesus had done. They had preached the gospel together. And not only that, we saw how they both criticized and judged Mary for anointing the Lord with that expensive perfume. Both had denied Jesus, betrayed him, and failed the Lord by both word and deed. Both were overwhelmed with grief and regret over uh, what they had done and realizing their sin. And both admitted and both confessed their sin. And yet only one ends up being restored by the Lord while the other went out and hanged himself. What's the difference? between the two. Why two entirely different responses in the end? What do we learn about these two men and their response to failure? Well, we discover first of all that Judas was overcome by regret. Peter was overcome by repentance. Uh, Judas uh, felt an intense amount of remorse. He felt regret, but you know that's not enough. I mean, our prisons today are filled with those who are, who are filled with remorse and regret. Mostly remorse and regret over being caught. They're sorry, but they're just sorry they got caught. Judas was overcome by regret. In fact, we see how he even returned the money. Judas even made restitution. But you know what? That's not enough. Why? Because there was no restoration. How are you restored when you blow it? The answer is found in the example of Peter. While Judas was overcome by regret, Peter was overcome and overwhelmed by repentance. Repentance. The original Greek word is the word metanoia, which means to turn. That's what repentance means, to turn. It means making an about face, a 180 degree turn. You're going this way, and you turn from sin, you turn to God. That's what repentance means. And without it, there's no restoration. Without repentance, there's no salvation. 
So what did Peter's repentance look like? Well, we discover that Peter's road back after failure, well, it looked like this. It's the same way it looks for you and me. And there are three steps back to God after failure. First of all, number one, he remembered the word of the Lord. It was the word that brought him back to repentance. Think about that. It was the word. The very first step in recovery is remembering the promises and warnings of God's word. A lot of people think that the Bible is this dusty old 2,000 year old book. No. Hebrews tells us, for the word of God is living and it's active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God is a living manuscript. Show me a person out of the will of God. I'll show you someone out of the word of God. Psalm 19, 119.9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 19, 105, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The first step back was the fact that Peter remembered the word. Do you feel distant from God? Get back to the word. Get back into his word and let his spirit speak to your heart through that which he has revealed to you. Well, his second step back after failure was he displayed a godly sorrow. The Bible tells us that there are two kinds of sorrow. There's a godly sorrow and there's a worldly sorrow. One leads to death and one leads to life. 2 Corinthians 7.10 explains, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And so obviously you can feel really bad about something and never change. Several years ago, a guy by the name of Luther Castile walked into a pub in uh, Elgin, Illinois with four guns and he opened fire. He killed two people. He wounded 16 others. At his trial, Castile was unrepentant. According to the Chicago Tribune, when asked by his attorney if he felt any remorse, here's what he said. Any feelings I have in that regard, I'll keep between myself and the Lord. He also said this, as ironic as this sounds, I'm actually a passionate giving person. I like to think I'm a pretty good person. I'm not one to hurt anyone that doesn't provoke me. <laughs> I read that and I thought, yeah, we're all pretty good people as long as no one provokes us. But sin is somehow someone else's fault and it's an uncharacteristic break from normal character. But the Bible says that no one is a pretty good person. We're all sinners. Until we repent, we're hopeless. Judas had a, a worldly sorrow and it produced nothing but regret leading to death. Peter, on the other hand, had a godly sorrow and it produced repentance that led to salvation. Well, we see a third step back to God after Peter's failure and it was the fact that he stayed in the group. Peter went back and he stayed with the other disciples. Uh, why is it that when we fail, sometimes the hardest people to face are church people? Why is that? Why are other Christians sometimes the most difficult to talk about and admit our own, our own sin and our own failings? Other believers should be the first people we turn to, the very first. Why? Because they're the only ones who can truly help restore us. It's really my brothers and sisters, you and I, together in the Lord, who can encourage each other and support one another and exhort one another and pray for one another and remind one another of God's word, his promises and his warnings. We need each other. I need you. You need me. And he uses all of us in the process of restoring and building us back together in unity as the body of Christ. You know, the, the Bible is packed full of people who were weak and failed. Why? Because the, those are the only type of people that there are. We're all weak. We all fail. We're all leaky vessels, aren't we? Raise your hand if you... No, I won't do that. One Bible teacher pointed out, Abraham was old, Jacob was insecure... Leah was unattractive, Joseph was abused, Moses stuttered, Gideon was poor, Samson was codependent, Rahab was immoral, David had an affair with all kinds of dysfunctional family problems, Elijah was suicidal, Jeremiah was depressed, Jonah was reluctant, Naomi was a widow, John the Baptist was eccentric to say the least, Peter was impulsive and hot-tempered, Martha worried a lot, the Samaritan woman had several failed marriages, Zac Zacchaeus was unpopular, Thomas had doubts, Paul had poor health, and Timothy was timid. <laughs> that's quite a variety of misfits 
That's the church. <laughs> we all, they all blew it. But in God's grace, he restored and he used every single one of those people for his own service. Our God is the God of the second chance. Praise God. And the third and the fourth. Again, he uses all of us in the process of restoring and, and building up one another. The church family, this one and every other church, is a mix of flawed individuals on a rescue mission for one another, commissioned by God. We need one another. You know, if we ever cease to be here at this church, the kind of family of God that are loving, accepting, and forgiving of one another, we will fail to be the kind of church that God wants us to be. You won't make it if you're outside the local church family. That's why Jesus commissioned the church. We need each other. There's no such thing as a lone ranger. There's no such thing in the New Testament as Christianity apart from the local church, being a part of a local church family. Peter stayed with the group. The fourth and final step back to God after Peter's failure was the fact that he responded to the Lord's grace. Judas didn't do that. Peter did. Peter was honest, honest enough to admit his sin, he confessed it, and he responded to God's grace. And, and though for a while Peter lost his discipleship, he, ne he never lost his sonship. He was still a son of the king. And you know, I don't think any one of us can condemn Peter. I think if we were in his shoes, many of us would have done the same thing, maybe all of us. But before we wag a critical finger at Peter, remember that the other disciples had abandoned Jesus already. Even though at a distance, even though his heart was flawed, even though there were cracks in his character, Peter still followed Jesus. Peter failed. He failed in a courtyard, a place where the other disciples didn't even dare enter. We really do serve the God of the second chance and the third and the fourth. He never, ever gives up on us. Praise God for that. God is in the transformation business. Nehemiah 9.17, you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. He does never forsake us. He's always with us every step of the way. Praise God for that.